Well, good afternoon. It's great to be back at Trillium Health Partners with Michelle and her amazing team. And to be back in the beautiful city of Mississauga with Mayor Crombie. And Mayor, I always tell you, I love the people of, of Mississauga as much as you do. I'm also joined by our finance minister, Rod Phillips, our long-term care minister, Dr. Mary Lee Fullerton, and our MPP for Mississauga Lakeshore, Rudy Cosetto. The team behind me has been working extremely hard to support our frontline healthcare workers and protect our most vulnerable seniors. And as the colder weather arrives, as we fight the second wave of COVID-19, one of my top priorities is the welfare of our long-term care residents. COVID-19 has impacted every area of our lives. It has changed absolutely everything. And this virus has shone a light. It has shone a spotlight on the deep cracks in our broken long-term care system. My friends, we inherited a long-term care system that suffered deeply from decades of underinvestment and neglect. COVID-19 exposed this for everyone to see. And as Premier, as difficult as it was, I wanted everyone to see it. Because it's only by bringing these issues to light that we can fix them. And I made a commitment to our long-term care residents, their families, and their caregivers. I promised we would fix the broken system. I promised we would give our residents the care and dignity they deserve. We didn't create this mess but I can tell you, we're going to fix it. Working through the summer, we delivered a plan with over a half a billion dollars to prepare our long-term care homes for future waves and surges of COVID-19. We provided funding to improve ventilation. We are finally mandating and installing air conditioning and better heating in older homes. We're building hundreds of new accelerated long-term care beds in months, not years, with partners like Trillium Health. And I also promised justice for our long-term care residents and their families. In July, I appointed a long-term care COVID-19 commission to investigate what happened, to get to the bottom of it, and help us fix this broken system. No stone will be left unturned in our efforts to improve long-term care. In fact, the commission has already delivered early recommendations to improve resident care. We're taking those very seriously, and that's why we're here today. We are wasting no time in starting to act on one of those key recommendations immediately. In the upcoming 2020 Ontario budget, we will be increasing average daily direct care in our homes to four hours a day compared to the, uh, the 2.75 hours. Now, to put that into perspective, folks, that's over 31% increased care for our loved ones. We're making sure a resident takes their heart medication three times a day. A grandparent is getting assistance they need with bathing, a change of clothes and meals, or helping mom or dad talk to the grandkids on the phone or on their iPad. To our residents and to their families and caregivers, four hours a day will make a world of difference. Across the sector, that means tens of thousands of additional hours of care for our residents. This is the gold standard in the long-term care sector, and we won't settle for anything less. This is a monumental step forward. It will mean hiring thousands and thousands of new support staff. And this historic investment will make Ontario the first jurisdiction in Canada to commit to four hours of care, something the sector has been striving towards for many, many years. This investment and the dignity and the care of our most vulnerable will make Ontario the leader among Canadian provinces in caring for our long-term care residents. And this is something we should all be proud of because how we care for our most vulnerable, how we care for those who cannot care for themselves, it's what defines us as a province, as Canadians. We know such an important change will take time to recruit and train the necessary staff but we start that work in earnest right now. The long, it's long overdue, but today we're making it right. We are setting an example for others to follow. We are blazing a new trail because our seniors, they built this province, they raised us, 
They taught us what it means to be Canadian. And with today's historic investment, we're showing them that we will stand by them just as they did for us. Thank you and God bless the people of Ontario. Now I'll hand it over to Minister Phillips. <clears throat> Thank you, Premier. On Thursday, I will release the 2020 Ontario budget, the next phase of Ontario's action plan. Back in March, as the global pandemic began and the state of emergency was declared, it was clear that there was too much uncertainty to present a full multi-year budget as we'd intended. So instead, we put forward a one-year economic and fiscal update, Ontario's action plan responding to COVID-19. It ultimately made $30 billion available in response to the global pandemic. This made us the first government in Canada to take this important step, because as any family or business owner understands, it is important to have a plan, especially in a time of high uncertainty. As we all know, COVID-19 has created an unprecedented level of risk to the global economy. So having a well thought out plan is more important than ever. The next phase of Ontario's action plan will make available every necessary resource to continue to protect people's health going forward. And it will expand the support our government has provided to those still facing financial hardships due to the pandemic, including families, workers, vulnerable people, seniors, and employers. It is a plan that will have three pillars. The first is protect, making good on Premier Ford's commitment to do whatever it takes to get through the pandemic. The plan we outline on Thursday will build on our initial response to COVID-19, including the $7.7 .7 billion in health response. That money is being spent to ramp up testing, build more hospital beds, protect loved ones in long-term care, and purchase critical PPE. There was never any question that the top priority of the 2020 Ontario budget would be protecting people's health. And there is no issue more pressing than long-term care. We can all agree that the loss of lives in long-term care homes here in Ontario and around the world is the greatest tragedy of COVID-19, which is why we are not waiting to act. Ontario is the first province in Canada to take the important step the Premier just announced, and Minister Fullerton will have more to say about that in a moment. Protecting people will be our top priority because it's the people's top priority. We are not doing it alone, though. Here at Trillium Health Partners and in other long-term care homes and hospitals around the province, our frontline heroes are leading the charge. To those heroes, we have a simple message. You have an army of 14.5 million people behind you. Our message to the people of Ontario is just as straightforward. As COVID-19 continues to threaten our health, we will be there to protect you. And now I'll hand it over to Minister Fullerton. Thank you, Minister Phillips, and uh, good afternoon. As a family doctor and as the daughter of a parent who was in long-term care, I entered politics because of the challenges facing this sector, challenges that I knew all too well, both professionally and personally. And today, as your Minister of Long-Term Care, it is with great pride that I stand here with Premier Ford and Minister Phillips as we share with you the most important change to long-term care in the history of our province. We are delivering on our promise to protect our seniors in long-term care by increasing the average daily direct care to four hours a day per resident. Our commitment includes an average of four hours of daily direct hands-on care provided by nurses or personal support workers. This is a monumental commitment and it will require significant changes in the long-term care sector. Our government is committed to working with all of our partners to educate, train and recruit the tens of thousands of new personal support workers and nurses that will be required. And we will set hard targets as we achieve this standard. We will measure and regularly report on the progress against these targets which will be outlined in the staffing strategy to be released in December. The increased level of care will help us dramatically enhance residents' quality of life, while at the same time reassuring family members about the care their loved one is receiving. 
This increase in direct care hours was one of the early recommendations made by the Independent Commission into long-term care. And while the Commission completes its work, our government is not waiting to act. We have already taken major steps to support our seniors, and the Premier has said it repeatedly. I have said it repeatedly. Improving the quality of life and care for long-term care residents is at the centre of everything we do. Thank you. And now I'm happy to introduce Michelle Emanuel, President and CEO of Trillium Health Partners. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Michelle Emanuel, President and CEO of Trillium Health Partners. I want to thank the Premier, Minister Phillips, and Fullerton, and MPP Cusato for their announcement here today. I want to thank the Premier and his government for their leadership that they have shown in the face of COVID-19 and this pandemic. At Trillium Health Partners, we believe in the power of partnership to deliver the best outcomes and to provide the best possible care to our community. Ontario has proven these months, these past months, that together we are stronger. We have seen it firsthand, the impact of COVID-19 and what it has on our seniors, particularly those in long-term care. During the first wave of COVID-19, Trillium Health Partners supported 19 long-term care homes within our community. I want to say it was an honour to do so. We need to invest in long-term care to ensure that some of the most vulnerable citizens in our community who have given so much of themselves throughout their lifetime have a safe place to call home, where they're treated with care, compassion, and respect. Trillium Health Partners is proud to play a role in improving access to high-quality long-term care in this community through the Accelerated Build Pilot project that we announced recently, two new long-term care homes. These two new 320-bed homes will be located next to a uh, new 10-bed hospice run by Heart Hospice here in our community. These homes will provide much-needed access to long-term care in Mississauga and relieve some of the pressure on local hospitals by offering patients in the community access to the health care services they need in the most appropriate place and within their community. Thank you again, Premier, Ministers and your government for your leadership and for making these important investments in the care of Mississauga seniors. It is now my honour to introduce our Mayor, Mayor Crombie. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to first acknowledge Michelle Emanuel and the hard work of everyone here at Trillium Health Partners. Michelle, you are an incredible leader in our community and have been instrumental in building Trillium into the world-class hospital system that it is today. I'd like to say it's always a great day in Mississauga, but even better when I have the opportunity to welcome all of you, Premier, especially you, to our great city for such an important announcement. I want to thank Minister Fullerton and Minister Phillips, Mississauga South Lakeshore MPP Rudy Cosetto, and of course, Premier Ford, for reaffirming your commitment to improving the overall health and well-being of seniors in our community. This announcement comes at a critical time. Our seniors in long-term care homes have been among the hardest hit by COVID, particularly in the first wave of the pandemic. We have lost members of our community. Family members have been left devastated, demanding better care for those seniors. This crisis truly exposed fractures in our long-term care system that need to be addressed. And today's announcement is, is an important step forward in addressing those issues. Increasing the daily hours spent on direct care to four hours per day will undoubtedly improve the quality of life for seniors in long-term care. It will help ease the minds of so many people with a loved one living in a long-term care home. 
knowing that their mother or father, brother or sister is getting the attention they need to age with dignity and grace. As you may know, Mississauga is the sixth largest city in Canada and one of the most culturally diverse cities in the world. We also happen to be home to a growing and aging population with the numbers of seniors in our city set to triple by 2031. This will undoubtedly increase the demand on our long-term care homes. Today's commitment from the provincial government goes a long way in ensuring that our seniors who built this great city will get the quality care that they so rightly deserve. I would like to again thank all of you, in particular Minister Fullerton and Premier Ford for aggressively tackling the issues facing our long-term care homes. And now I'd like to call on Mississauga Lakeshore MPP Rudy Cazetto to say a few words. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As the MPP for Mississauga Lakeshore, I'd like to thank Premier Ford, Minister Phillips, and Minister Fullerton for sharing today's wonderful news about increasing the hours of direct care for long-term care residents. I know that Michelle Demanuel and her outstanding staff at the Trillium Health Partners and the Camilla Care community and long-term care homes across Mississauga have been working incredibly hard and very closely together to ensure the right protocols are in place to protect our most vulnerable seniors and caregivers during the second wave of COVID-19. For that, we owe them a debt of gratitude. We also are working together to build new capacity, including two new long-term care homes at Sheridan Park here in Mississauga Lakeshore with 640 new long-term care beds, modern HVAC systems, private rooms already next year in 2021. Whether it's building new capacity or modernizing our current facilities, our government is doing everything in our power to improve the quality of care that all residents receive to provide our seniors with a comfortable and safe place to call home. Thank you to everyone for coming. I look forward to continuing working together with our great team to build a better long-term care system for Ontario. Thank you. That's great, uh, Christine. Before we, we start, I just want to give a shout out to all the people in Ottawa. Uh, everyone's done an incredible job. We're looking at the numbers. Uh, you've dropped uh, all the way down to 61 cases. Things are, are, are looking so much better there. And, you know, I know, I know a few people were a little upset 28 days ago or close to 28 days ago. And uh, it was the right decision, I can assure you. And with your help, uh, with the mayor's leadership, Mayor Watson, you did a great job. Uh, we're down to 61 cases, so I just want to give you a big shout out. Do you know what I find myself doing when, no matter if it, it was back when Windsor Essex had a few bumps in the road or, or Ottawa, you know, every night I'm sitting there cheering, cheering the the uh, folks on. And as we're going to be cheering uh, Peel and and Toronto on Mayor Crombie, I want to tell you, you're doing an incredible job, great leadership, along with Mayor Brown, which had a conversation this morning, Mayor Thompson and Peel, and everyone needs to be cheering Peel uh, along. Everyone is trying, along with uh, Toronto as well. Had a good conversation, a visit with Mayor Tory yesterday. I uh, went to a testing site, so everyone's pitching in. I'm, I'm so, so grateful for everyone's support uh, out there and right across the, the province. We'll go to the phone line for questions. Just a reminder, one question and one follow-up, please. Your first question comes from Ashley Legasic with News Talk 1010. Please go ahead. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Premier. Thank you for taking my question. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that the TDSB has elected to give bonuses to principals and vice principals for coming into schools early during the pandemic. First, I just want your reaction on that. And second, what would you say to all the frontline workers in our province who make far less money than principals and vice principals and did go above and beyond their job description during the pandemic without extra pay? Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone. Everyone uh, went above and, and beyond. I'll, I'll have to dig into it with the, the Minister of Education and get the, the full details. But uh, again, everyone, everyone's done an incredible job and I hear what you're saying. But in, in saying all that, you know, I had an opportunity to visit some schools and talk to the principals and vice principals. Uh, they're, they're the ones that uh, are along with the teachers, of course, and the parents 
have made our, cool, our, our schools uh, safe. Uh, and there, if there was one thing that's working uh, throughout the whole system, I think a lot of things are working, but it's the schools. Uh, they're working and you have to give credit where credit's due. As for uh, the, the bonus, I'll have to look into that. Follow up. Thank you. Uh, and there are reports that Cabinet will meet uh, this afternoon to review what the health officials have come up with in terms of reopening indoor dining and gyms safely. Is there any portion of the plan you'd be willing to share with us today? And when exactly will you be announcing those details in order to provide time for businesses to prepare? Well, we want to review the, the plan uh, with, with uh, our, our Cabinet. I know Dr. Williams is putting the plan in front of us. And uh, again, I'm going to be in full communications with uh, the mayors of all the regions and be in touch with Mayor, Mayor Crombie, which has been an absolute champion in, in making sure that uh, they, they have the support that these restaurants need. I know uh, we talk frequently and, and she's advocating big time for, for restaurants, small business owners, as she should for mayor. But we both agree we have to do it safely, uh, you know, very safely. But we'll, we'll be able to review uh, what the health tables brought to us and we'll make that uh, decision next question. very soon. Your next question comes from Brian Lilly with the Toronto Sun. Please go ahead. Hi, Brian. Hi, I'd like to hear from uh, both you, uh, Premier, but also Mayor Crombie on this. Um, yeah. If Dr. Williams had shown up and said that there were three cases in, or sorry, three outbreaks, in Ottawa, 2% of all outbreaks, or three outbreaks in Peel, 3% of all outbreaks. If those were the numbers presented to you, would you have said, yes, I think we need to close all restaurants in, in Ottawa and Peel on October 8th, 9th, when you made the decision? And Mayor Crombie, uh, your thoughts of, upon seeing the data the last week that, uh, that showed that there were uh, minimal numbers, and, and, and I understand numbers that your own medical officer disputes mm -hmm. well brian first of all thank, thanks for the question if we want to really really break it down there's two regions uh peel and toronto they represent about 28 percent of the whole population of ontario but represent 62 percent of the the cases and then you could break peel down a little further you could break it down to the 100 and i think 67 cases over in, in in brampton and and mayor brown's been a champion out there he's working hard and uh, it's frustrating to any mayor or myself when we see the, the numbers go up and, and they, work, they work so hard. So again, Brian, I, I got to rely on our, our uh, medical officers and the advice that they're giving me. I'm glad what we did in, in, uh, in Ottawa. We, we saw the numbers uh, going down and that, that's a real uh, positive thing to see. But again, uh, I have to listen to the health and science and don't kid yourself for a minute. And you know as well as I do, Brian, because I'm public about it, we have some real deep, deep debates in caucus and in cabinet. And I can assure you, uh, we don't all agree. Uh, at the end of the day, we have to make a decision and, and move forward. So let's, let's see what the health table brings to us today. And hopefully we'll have some uh, better news over the next few days. I'll pass it to Mayor Crombie. Thank you for the question, Brian. So what I would say to that is that we did get advice from Dr. Lowe suggesting that we close down at, at exactly the right time, notwithstanding the only 3% in restaurants, 3% in gyms for us, we were seeing an uptick in numbers and it allowed us to pause, to take that, you know, to step back and look at where the trans transmission was occurring. And we closed down at the right time to give everybody a breather and say, we need to take this seriously once again, folks, let's be vigilant, let's calm things down. We know that there could be a spillover effect, whether it's folks from Toronto coming into Mississauga or Mississaugans going going into Milton or, or, or York, and as you saw, the Premier saw that that was a potential as well and closed down York. But now that we've taken that pause and we're looking a little more closely at those numbers, we're getting the best advice that we can from our public health officials, and we've analyzed the data, and we're not seeing the transmission occurring in our restaurants, our bars, and our gyms, but we are seeing it from social transmission, from social gatherings, from community gatherings, from kids hanging out, from dinner parties, backyard parties, 
Marty's Barbecue. And, and that is the trade-off. So should we reopen the businesses soon? And I, I sincerely hope we do so when it's safely, may I add. We'll do so. I know the Premier will do so on the advice of the medical officers of health when it's safe to do so. But that'll have to come at the expense of something else. We'll have to better control and better enforce those social gatherings and those social settings where we are seeing the transmission spreading. I hope that helps, Brian. Thank you. Follow up. Yeah, Premier, you didn't come close to answering my question at all. I mean, you skated around it quite uh, ably. and Maybe you can join the Leafs in, in the next season. You were that good at skating. But oh, I, you didn't come close to answering it. I asked you, would you have closed Ottawa and Peel at the recommendation of knowing that there were three outbreaks over three months in those respective regions? And, you know, I, I've spoken to your staff at, at the highest level who say that that was not the information presented to you on October 8th. So would you, if Dr. Williams had come to you and said, there are three outbreaks in Peel and three outbreaks in Ottawa, and, and quite frankly, 27 over the 7,500 restaurants across uh, Toronto, a city of 3 million, would you have, with those numbers, recommended closing all restaurants? Well, I appreciate the compliment. I, I think I'm a little too overweight to join the Leafs, but maybe I'll try out this year. Uh, Brian, what I do is I take the advice off the chief medical officer. Am I, uh, am I happy what we did? I'm never happy. It was it necessary? It was necessary, especially in Ottawa. We saw the numbers spiking. And the, the result, after we did it, the numbers have come down now. And uh, so once I, I take the advice and... What, what, I'm, what I'm hearing from you, they weren't showing me the right figures at the beginning. Well, that, that's a pretty strong statement uh, that you're, you're accusing the doctors of, of doing. But again, I have to believe the doctors. When, when you go to the doctors, Brian, and they say, you know, X, Y, Z, something's wrong, do you, do you say, no, I'm, I'm not going to listen to you? And, and then you have four other doctors tell you the same thing, uh, that there's something wrong with you. Do you just ignore it? I, I don't ignore it. I have to listen to them. Brian, why don't we look at what's happening in France right now? France, there's a complete lockdown. Uh, people can't be leaving their house. There's curfews. You see it in UK. You see it in Spain. You see it in Ireland. And it's amazing how the whole world, including certain areas of Canada and, and the US, are saying, you got to close the restaurants. You got to close the gyms. Maybe they're all wrong. And maybe you're the only person that's right or some few other people that are right. I'm not too sure but I'll always take the advice of the, the docs and uh, I'd rather err on the side of caution if, if any errors happen than just go uh, hog wild and just let everything open up. As we see what's happening in across our country with Manitoba, if you do it per capita, it's thousands of cases happening every day, similar out to Alberta. We see the issues in Quebec. We see what's happening uh, in the Wisconsin and Michigan and Illinois. Uh, it's it's uh, right now down there. It's an absolute disaster. So we've been doing pretty good, uh, all considering around the world. Uh, matter of fact, we've been doing really good, thanks to the advice in the the docs, thanks to all the support that we've seen in jurisdictions from Mayor Bron uh, Mayor uh, Bonnie Crombie or or uh, other mayors. You know, it's a it's just a very difficult position I'm in, Brian. And I have to uh, balance it. I'm, I'm doing the best I can with the advice I'm getting. Next question. Your next question comes from Graham Richardson with CTV Ottawa. Please go ahead. Hi, Graham. How are you doing? Hi, Premier. Um, what do you think? What do you think? Uh, why do you think Ottawa responded the way it did? Uh, because you're not seeing the same numbers yeah. and the same. Uh, the same downslope in places like Toronto and Peel yeah. uh, yet. Is it, <clears throat> is it timing that will come or what do you think it is? I think they really listened. They hunkered down. Uh, the mayor showed uh, great leadership as the mayor here. Mayor Crombie showing great leadership. You couldn't ask for a better leader than Mayor Crombie in Mississauga. Um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, as we talk, she's up all night thinking how she can, uh, you know, Help, help Mississauga. I'm, I'm in the same boat, and so are the other, the mayors. Are, are they feeling a little bump in the road, in Peel? Yes. Then you got to look at Peel in itself. Uh, again, you have uh, Brampton, and this is 
uh, you know, Brampton's a great place. The mayor, Brown, is a champion. We were out there last week. The guy, he's probably up all night as well. But they represent 4% of uh, the overall, all, overall population. And, uh, you know, 28% uh, of the, the cases per se. So, I don't know, he's, he's trying his, uh, his hardest to. We all just have to stick together and uh, work together, and we have been. I can tell you, uh, I've never seen more cooperation between 444 municipalities, the province, and the federal government. We're all communicating constantly. I mean constantly. I just got off the phone with the Deputy Prime Minister, literally, before I walked through the door. Uh, anything that we need, any, anything you need help with. Same with the mayors. I'm in constant uh, communication with them. So we're all pitching in, but the people that they are helping us most are, are the people out there, the 14 and a half million people, businesses and, and residents of, of Ontario. Follow up? Uh, yeah, follow up on another subject. There's some suggestion that uh, your numbers have gone up in terms of your approval rating for the way you've handled the pandemic situation. I, I don't understand, though, why you don't just cut this McVetty thing off. Like, you could do it with the stroke of a pen. And people who maybe didn't vote for you before were looking at this uh, pandemic response saying, hey, maybe he's, uh, maybe he's someone I could, I could look at. And then this McVetty thing comes up, and it just it doesn't seem to make sense. Why don't you just shut it down? Well, they're going to go through the process. You know, I, I, I believe everyone should have an opportunity to go through the proce process. And uh, they're going through the process. And let's find out what happens when PCAP makes a decision. We'll, we'll make a decision from there. Next question. Your next question comes from Mike Crawley with CBC News. Please go ahead. Um, Hi, Hi, Premier. I'm How you doing? wondering what's going on with uh, flu shots because uh, your government keeps talking about uh, how there isn't a problem and yet you've got a major pharmacy chain, uh, Rexall, cancelling people's uh, flu shot appointments because they say there is a uh, province-wide uh, shortage of vaccines. How can you um, stand there and tell people that you've got this under control when that's what uh, a major pharmacy chain is, is doing? Well, Mike, good, good question. Let me just break down the numbers. We ordered 5.1 million, that's 700,000 more than last year. On top of that, we ordered another 300,000, <clears> so a million more doses. Uh, right now, pharmacies have given over a million flu shots, and in total, uh, 4.8 million have been distributed. So there's still uh, a long ways to go. We, we have uh, 30, what is it, 33 percent of the population, one third of the population has received it. Let me flip this around. Isn't this great news that we've seen an increase of flu shots of 500 percent? People are listening, and uh, we're doing everything we can. As for Rexall, my friends in Rexall, you knew the allocations that you had, so don't overbook people. It's very simple as that. You knew exactly how many flu shots you had, similar to shoppers. So don't overbook. If you know you have X amount of flu shots, book X amount of flu shots. But, you know, if you have uh, 100 flu shots, don't book 200 people. You won't have the problem. We're doing everything we can to work with uh, McKesson, which has been a great partner, and, and Rexall, along with shoppers and a lot of the other uh, pharmacies. But uh, we, we've ordered a million in total more than last year. And uh, you have to order them in advance. We ordered them back in last January. So we're doing everything we can to make sure uh, as many people get that vaccination as possible. Follow up. Uh, and Premier, given some of the stuff that you just said about what's going on in, uh, you know, in Europe, uh, in other provinces, and given that Ontario's uh, seven day average of cases is still on the rise, um, and also given uh, the report I had out today about how full um, most of the hospitals are, why would you be considering loosening COVID-19 restrictions at the, uh, at the end of this week? You might, you know, we're, we're taking advice from the health table. Do you know what I love? I have to put a smile on Mike because I have Brian tell me, why didn't you open up earlier? And then we got Mike tell me, why are you doing it? So I'm, I'm just trying to do a happy balance, folks. You know, I listen to the health, I listen to the, uh, the, the folks that have small businesses, and there, there has to be a happy balance. So I'll take the advice from the health table. We'll see if they're recommending to open up safely again, 
and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. But we, we, we have to create a, a happy balance. If you go one way, it's not too good. If you go the other, it's not good. So we're, we're, we're doing pretty good as, as a province. That's, that's what I can tell you compared to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. So we must be doing something right uh, here. Last question. Your final question comes from Emma Palin with HuffPost Canada. Please go ahead. Anna, how are you doing? Hi, my question is for Minister Fullerton. Yep. Minister, before getting into politics, you were a vocal advocate for Canada to adopt a hybrid public-private healthcare system. Does this impact your vision for long-term care? Do you find that private players are stifled by government involvement? I think this is about making sure that people get the care they need when they need it, and that's definitely what we're doing in long-term care, really putting the resident at the centre and making sure that uh, we bring the resources to them and their families so that they can get the support that they need. This is uh, about the resident at the centre and making sure they can get the care they need when they need it. Follow-up. Okay. Um, and at the time when you were an advocate, you made some pretty serious claims about Canada's healthcare system. You warned that politicians may start encouraging euthanasia rather than provide health care. Why did you say that and do you still believe that that's a threat to Canadians? Well, we're t you're talking about some discussion back uh, years ago with uh, medically assisted death in terms of our obligations to um, Canadians and Ontarians. And so that discussion has been had. I think the court has ruled on that. Uh, and so we need to focus on what we have to do for long-term care, how we repair and rebuild and advance long-term care, make sure that people get the care they need when they need it. And our government is committed to doing that and repairing a very broken system in long-term care. Uh, and uh, we're taking every measure possible going forward, not just through COVID-19, but also um, stabilizing this sector after many, many years of neglect by previous governments. So there's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done and uh, we're doing it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks, everyone.